Hello there. Today I'm looking at a Ryobi OnePlus 30 minute battery charger that's received an accidental dose of 240 volts in North America where we use 120 volts. Now unfortunately I didn't film any of the removal or diagnosis of this unit so bear with me here. Now basically the whole unit is contained on this one circuit board here. Um, we look at the underside you're gonna see one little scorch mark on the bottom of the transformer ignore that that was me I did that um, when I opened this unit it passed the smell test did not smell burned uh, power got through the diodes and the varistors and everything were okay capacitors fine but there was no power going into the transformer so I knew that this power supply switch that's what I'm gonna call it was not working um, as you can see it has a nice crack along it that I noticed after I took it off so there's your smoking gun and unfortunately the crack goes right through one of the numbers so they did have a 258 version of this but I looked at it very closely and I'm pretty sure it's 256 now I won't delve too deeply into the electronic theory but let me give you a quick overview in a modern switching power supply such as this the power comes in gets rectified to DC, and is then switched on and off very, very fast at a frequency much higher than 60 hertz. That switched power is then fed into the transformer as quote-unquote AC. Transformers only work on AC. And when you use a very high frequency, you can then use a very small transformer, which saves weight, expense, and size. Now, the part I'm replacing, I'm calling it the power supply switch, is basically just a fancy transistor, and it's responsible for doing the switching of the power that goes into the transformer. Now I want to apply just a little bit, just a little dot of thermal paste to this. Thermal paste is conductive, so you don't want it touching any of the pins or contacts or anything like that once it's been squeezed out the sides. I found that the easiest way to hold this uh, chip was to hold one of the protruding legs uh, with a pair of fine needle nose pliers and then just sort of drop it into the holes. The goal here is that I want it completely installed onto this large aluminum heat sink so that when I solder it in, everything will be in the correct place. This is the clamp that holds it down onto the heat sink. And I'm just installing it loosely for now until I can get it aligned where I want it. Now I want to make absolutely certain that I don't crush the chip when I tighten down the clamp. So the little bend in the clamp has to sit perfectly over the edge, the top edge of the chip, so that it doesn't catch it and crush it and break it. Now always remember your medium when you're tightening a bolt. I'm tightening a steel bolt into an aluminum heat sink while I'm squishing a very sensitive plastic chip under a clamp so it has to be just tight enough that the bolt will not come loose because this thing is you know in a work zone and it's going to get tossed around but it cannot be so tight that it'll crush the chip or strip the aluminum
Now I'm getting ready to solder and I'll warm up my soldering iron. And I've got the flux out. I'm going to put a little bit of flux on all the little legs of the chip. And yes, you could do this without flux, but I like my life to be easier. So I use flux. Now this is uh, what you call a solder suck. This is what you use to desolder the uh, chip. You heat up the, each joint and then you put this over it and suck the wet solder out of it. And hopefully you're left with an open hole that you can just pull the pins of the chip through. Now the soldering is done, it's time for a little cleanup. Whether you're using just flux or flux cord solder and flux like I'm doing, it will leave residue on the back of the board. And many cases you can just leave it there and it's totally harmless, but we are dealing with rectified main voltage, which is going to be around 150 volts DC. That's pushing it to the limits of safety, so I would rather be safe than sorry and just clean it. I do use a screwdriver to scrape between the joints to make sure that there is no bridging of the solder from one joint to another and also to scrape the flux away, but very light pressure only. You don't want to damage the circuit board. Then I'll use some brake cleaner and that'll soften up the flux and allow me to wipe it off. Just making a little touch up here. Now it's time for a test. I am doing this with the circuit board out of the plastic case, so you have to be very careful to put it on a non-conductive surface and not to touch anything. And as you can see, the indicator light is on, so that means the power is getting through the transformer and to the other side of the circuit board with the charge control on it. That means it's working, and I did my job. Now, dealing with 120 volts AC is actually a lot safer than people would have you believe. It just hurts. Uh, but dealing with rectified 150 or so volts DC is dangerous and it can and will burn you if you get zapped in the wrong way. So, since this has been powered up, I need to be really careful how I handle it. Now I had trouble putting the board back in because there's this little finger right there that it has to go perfectly vertically down into the top half of the case. Of course, by the time I finally realized that I could discharge the capacitors by shorting them out with a screwdriver, it still hadn't yet occurred to me that the unit is functional now. So those capacitors will just discharge themselves because the electricity is going through that chip that I replaced into the transformer to the charge circuitry and then being dissipated as heat through resistance and stuff. 
unlike earlier when the unit was not working and the charge in the capacitors had nowhere to go. And that's about it. I have since returned this charger to my friend and he's put it back to rigorous use and it's working just fine. Hey, if you liked this video, don't forget to like this video. Consider subscribing and thanks for watching.